doing push-ups and everything. We didn't know what a push-up was. And uh, tell us how good we had it. Got off that farm, got here in the army, now you got it made. <laughs> and, I, and I was sitting there agreeing with him. I said, yeah, that's right. It's a lot easier than that farm was. It was so hard on the farm. Oh, man. It gets, it gets tiresome on the farm after a few years. Plowing, it's not like today. So when, you, when did you start plowing? How, how old were you? About eight. <laughs> had you on a tractor or behind a mule or what? We didn't have no tractors. We had mules. Uh, the first tractor I seen was the year that I left home. We had a Ford tractor. And I, I couldn't drive it because I wasn't allowed to. <laughs> and anyway, uh, got off the farm, went to Fort Jackson for basic training. Went down to the reception center, that's where the, you come in on the train from the induction station, and they uh, give you uh, certain things there. For one thing, the first thing you do is put you in this big theater and read the Uniform Code of Military Justice to you. That puts you on arm, under Army law, right there. And still, still do that, same thing. Uniform Code of Military Justice, 163 chapters of it. You had to know, you had to go over that. If you had any questions, you'd go back to the back and ask the questions about, I didn't understand what he said about this, but you had to understand the military law. Now, after you got out of that, went back up to the barracks, and there you learned how to put on the uniform, put your brass on, put your belt buckle on. Make sure you had a straight gig line. That's from the top of the belt of shirt to the last button on the pants. That was the gig line. Mm. Don't have none of that crooked. Be in big trouble. Uh, showed you how to shine your shoes. Shoes is hard to shine in because they were rough, like today's shoes, matter of fact. But we took a dog tag and go back and forth across that thing and shine them. Oh, uh -huh. and uh, from there, this was down at the induction station now, not up to unit yet. You're not in basic training yet. You're still... No, not in basic training yet. Yeah, in the induction station, which is just a bunch of people is probably less than they should be or they wouldn't be down there in the first place. So this is a nicer place than basic training. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's nicer than basic training, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was better, it was better there than on the farm. <laughs> so... Went on up to the unit after a few days, and uh, best I remember, I was about five days in this tent, uh, and these other guys down there, being harassed, run outside. If it rained, have a formation, in, look at the rain, and stuff like that. That's so you're learning how to march, learning how to just be a soldier. We learn how to act like a soldier. <laughs> yeah, maybe well, not be one yet. What? Does a whistle mean when it blows? Means you get in formation. Uh, what does it mean when they holler chow? Means you run fast you can toward the mess hall and get as far up in front of the line as you can get. Now you're talking about seven or eight hundred men at one time. And you can just get run over and trumped if you don't watch it. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I pulled my little duty down the mess hall two times. And then finally went on up to my unit. Well, I found out right the day I moved in there, matter of fact, that the country music singer Farron Young was in the platoon with me. Well, he thought he was pretty famous, so he wanted to go up and introduce himself to the first sergeant. By the time the first sergeant got through with him, he didn't think he was so famous. <laughs> and so I spent eight weeks with him. With him. So y'all became buddies? Uh -huh. Y'all became friends? Not really. I thought he was, but not really. He he really wasn't nobody's friend much. Mm -hmm. He pretended to be a friend to get favoritism, but he wasn't much of a friend. Uh, he, I like to sing. <laughs> and, well, he killed himself, you know. Oh, I know that. Yeah. And, uh, While he was in the military? or No, no. This long after he got out of the military. But uh, anyway, uh, like I say, I like his singing. He had some good songs, but I didn't like him personally. Well, I got in basic train up there, 
Nobody still don't know where I'm at. My parents think I've gone up to St. Louis to my uncle's, and I had uh, two sisters knew where I was. Uh -huh. uh, my oldest brother knew where I was, but that's all ones knew where I was. Well, I finished basic training and come home on leave in my uniform. My mother fainted. <laughs> well, you're still too young. Uh, you're still six. I'm, you're, I'm still too young to be in the military. So you're still 16. But, you're about to turn 17. But they was talking about get me put out, and my daddy told him, leave him alone. <laughs> if he wants the military, let him get in the military. He's there, leave him alone. <laughs> so he let me stay in. <laughs> Didn't say a word. So they, you have three siblings, two sisters, and one brother, and you're the I, baby? I got four sisters and four? Three, three brothers. Oh. I got one sister left myself. And you're, you're the baby? Are you um, the youngest? Betty is the baby. She lives right over here. Oh. And I'm third down the line from the baby. Okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, my oldest brother had already been in the military. He, he was in World War II in the Navy. Uh, my brother next to me, two years older than me, he got drafted about a year after I joined. Mm. My youngest brother got drafted about a year after he did. So we was all in the military in World War II or Korea. And anyway, uh, all in the Army except my oldest brother, he was in the Navy. After I finished basic training, I went to uh, Ricondo School. Give you one great promotion. Tell me more about basic training. What was it like for you? Was it oh, well, was basic it big... basic training to me was easy. You go out and shoot, you rifle, you go on road marches, you you learn how to pack your gear, you learn how to take care of yourself in the field. Um, to me, basic training was easier than the farm. Did everybody make it through? Uh, them that didn't make it got sent back to another company, and then they. We'd have to make it. Oh, they did again. Oh, they have to do it again. <laughs> yeah, they'd have to make it. Uh, they they wouldn't know. Well, I don't like this, so I'm quitting. Didn't do that. Huh? Mm -hmm. But I, I thought base training was kind of easy. Uh, we shot all kind of weapons. I was going to be infantry. Then I decided I'd be airborne infantry. So that put a lot more training on me, in particularly in the weapons field. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had 12 weeks of basic training. After six weeks, you get a pass. Six weeks before you get a pass. Once you got your first pass, you get a pass every weekend if you didn't mess up. But watch it or you'll mess up because they'll find something. <laughs> but I got along very well with the people in the military. I got along with my superiors, which is PFCs and buck sergeants. And uh, I, I liked the military. Anyway, about, uh, I guess I'd been down there six weeks. My two sisters, their husbands, come down and visit me. They, the one sister didn't know I was in the military until after she got down there. The other one did. <laughs> they come down to visit me for the weekend. This is still at Fort Jackson, right? I was still at Fort right. Jackson. So you had 12 weeks of basic training in. And uh, my platoon sergeant wouldn't give me a pass. <laughs> Well, I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to get a pass anyway. I went and talked to the first sergeant. The first sergeant said, I don't know why he won't give you a pass. Let's call him over here. He called him over, and he had absolutely no reason not to give me a pass. So the first sergeant said, you give him a pass, and there won't be no harassment about this. Okay, first sergeant. <laughs> so I got my pass. The first respect I had for the first sergeant. And he let me off from... Friday night to Monday morning. And uh, I don't know. Uh, Did you get harassed? Uh, Did you get harassed later on? No, no, I never <laughs> get harassed about that. Uh, anyway, uh, my sister didn't go back and tell my mother still that I was in the military. I asked them not to, and they didn't, because I figured they'd try to get me put out or try to. Yeah. Well, time went on, and I finished basic training. Went to uh, Ricardo School, which is a four weeks course of kind of like ranger school I went to later. And and then went to jump school. You had to go to Ricardo School before you went to jump school. 
uh, if you didn't have no prior training. Well, I thought uh, Ricardo School, I, I didn't think it was hard at all. You just kind of coasting through doing what they told you to do. Then jump school, it was tougher. Jump school's tough, it don't matter when you go through it. And But uh, it's not something that's that tough. Uh, if you, I don't know, they tell you everything to do, you come up and look out that door there playing the first time, it's a long ways down there. <laughs> but still, it's it's nothing so fearful about it because you already had the training, everything been explained to you, you you are thoroughly briefed on your equipment you're using, and all the training you take from leaving the plane to landing on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't I didn't see anything hard about uh, jump school either. So the army's just it was just easy for you. <laughs> just uh, it was easy for me. Everything was easy, uh -huh. and. and uh, Got to uh, jump school, and I expected to go to Korea. I was going to join the 187th Airborne, I thought. Got my orders and went to Germany. So you're you're 17 years old. How old are you now? How old am I now? 80. No, I mean... <laughs> oh, at that time? That time. At that time, I was... Uh, eight. I was still 17. You're still 17? I ain't quite... Yeah, March ain't come yet. Okay. Uh, I was still 17. It was uh, a couple of months later I turned 18. But anyway... Uh, so after jump school, you were you got sent to Germany? Got sent to Germany. Well, in Germany, uh, I was in the 12th Constabulary, which was the people that traveled around over Germany to make sure Nazi bands didn't form. They still tried to form after the war. Hmm. And, uh, Make sure Nazi bands didn't form. I was, and we was uh, airborne and all that stuff, you know, and nothing hard about that, cause they didn't they didn't fight us back or anything. You were like just like huh? like you were like po po policemen or something, or how how did you stop that from happening? What you do? Oh, we just well we had these uh, half tracks with two uh, with quad fifty calibers on. We had uh, water guns. Now, what water guns was the same thing as these quad fifties, except they squirted water instead of bullets. <laughs> and if any of the Germans tried to raise any uh, disturbance at all, um, we had to put it down. Mm. And we did. We, at first, we got a little going there, but that didn't last long. The Germans. They done seen the benefit of being Americanized and turned around real fast. Yeah. But at first, they was a little hard to get along with. Um, but then everybody got to be friends with the Germans. And so uh, we just had a good old time. Everything was cheap over there. You couldn't spend your money because nothing cost nothing much. Get a carton of cigarettes for 80 cents. No. <laughs> and I didn't smoke, but I'd buy them and sell them downtown. They, they would uh, pay my weekend downtown. <laughs> uh, anyway, Germany, uh, you was in the field a lot. And when I say in the field, I mean up in the woods. We, up, we, would, we had a section of the Czechoslovakian border. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. That's what we controlled. And uh, we had Quonset huts that they used previously before we was in there to store ammunition in. We lived in them Quonset huts. What are those? What are those? What's a Quonset hut? Up on, well, you know, it's a Quonset hut is a, it's a tin building, igloo type. Okay, yeah, yeah. And, and they're pretty large. They're basically made to, you can take them down and move them and uh, bolt them back together. And they're previously made for the ammunition storage area. Then they found other uses for them. But we was living in those things. The regiment I was in with the 12th Constabulary, uh, we was living in the Quonsets in the winter. And they gave us some heaters. Uh, There's burnt oil. And uh, we was living pretty good, really. Uh, and again, I didn't see anything hard about the Army. I thought it's Nice place to be. <laughs> uh, I stayed up there and stayed in Germany that time about 
a year, and I volunteered to go to Korea. Well, little to my thinking, I, I thought I'd never get selected. Yeah, you're going. And I off went back to the United States for some previous training before I go to Korea. Sent me to Fort Chaffee, Arkansas. At that time it was Camp Chaffee, Arkansas, for indirect fire training, which that's calling artillery, uh, calling mortar fire, things like that. And I went to that school about eight weeks, the best I remember, and then on to uh, Sasebo, Japan, to be assigned, I thought, to 187 Airborne. Got down to Sasebo, Japan, got my orders, and it said 57 fill artillery. And I said, I've never been no artillery, I don't know what this is about. <laughs> so I headed down to personnel to see the personnel sergeant. Personnel sergeant said, I don't hear none of your noise. He didn't want to talk to me. So said, I want to see the major. I knew a major's charge, so I want to see a major. So he said, all right, smart ass. <laughs> well, let's get you in there and see the major. So in I went to see the major. I slewed the major and told him why I was there. And he said, well, what's wrong with your assignment? I said, well, it's not airborne. And he said, I never did like airborne, so I don't hear nothing about that. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm losing my jump pay. He said, well, that's something to be concerned about, but I can't do anything about it. And uh, so we talked on and on. And after a while, he said, you got anything else to say? Well, I did, but he didn't give me the opportunity. He called me to attention about face and moved me out of his office. <laughs> I went to the 57 Field Artillery which had nothing to do with where I was signed. I stayed in 57 Phil Artillery for nine months. The war ended, of course, and then all of the RAs, regular army, we got extended over there, and the U.S. is the draftees, got to come home. So, well, no, I won't say all 100%, but just about 100%. So I stayed in Korea that time for, oh, over a year, so and when did you first go to Korea? When, what, you remember 1953. The and, and then uh, I got out in 54, out of Korea. As a matter of fact... Do you remember it, where you were in Korea or anything? Sasebo. 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 Uh, and Weejon, no, Weejon Bu, I believe was the name of the town we was in mostly. We were up close to the 17th parallel line where the Chinese was right there and we were right here. And even though it was a ceasefire, what people don't know that from April, no, not April, from July the 14th, 1953, we had a ceasefire. We didn't have no armistice. We just quit shooting each other, that's all. Every once in a while, somebody cracked down on somebody, but basically, everybody had quit, supposedly, quit shooting at each other. And this went on for the rest of the time I was there. I finally moved from there to Japan and joined the 187 Airborne in Sasebo, in uh, Hayoka, Japan, up in the mountain. <laughs> from there, uh, for just a few months, we moved back to Fort Bragg and was broke up and integrated into the 82nd Airborne. Well, I found out since I'd been out of jump status over a year, I had to go to jump school again. So I went to jump school again. <laughs> and there was nothing I could do about it. Huh. After I went to jump school, they come out with a new order saying, if you'd been to jump school once, you didn't have to go again. <laughs> so that's the way it went. I got to go to jump, got to go to jump school twice. You can probably never have enough training, though. <laughs> oh, so it, it was, didn't bother me much. I, but anyway, uh, when we, when we finished jump school, they give us all a special citation, which was on paper, for having 10 jumps on graduation instead of five jumps like most of the other troops. Because <laughs> we had five before. So you I haven't mean, done any jumping outside of training yet, have you? No, well, huh. this in training. Yeah. And uh, we, we had five jumps in training, and then uh, we had, when we had to go, 
There's quite a few of us that's out there. We had to go back to jump school when we got down to Fort Bragg and go through jump school again. Well, that was ten jumps, because you do five in jump school, plus the other train. I could see a little bit of a little bit of benefit in sending them back because the truth was pretty green just going to jump school and send them to Korea. Sure. And and so I could I could see some uh, sense in sending them back to jump school because they hadn't seen a parachute or a airplane in a year. But uh, anyway, we finally all that was over and I got assigned to the 325 Airborne Infantry, uh, 82nd Airborne. Did the military ever find out or the Army ever find out that you were too young? Oh, yeah. Uh, was in there when I got ready to re-enlist, and I was down the 82nd then, when I got ready to re-enlist... So what, what's your rank now? Are you still a private? Uh, at that time, I was a corporal. I didn't make corporal. Okay, you're a corporal. And... Uh, Anyway, I got called down by the CID criminal investigation, and they wanted to question me about my age limit. How old are you? I said, How old does my paperwork sound? Don't be a smart ass with me, Carl. <laughs> How old are you? I said, Well, let me see. I come in the army. I was eighteen. I've been in two, a little over two years, so that makes me almost twenty. No, 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 no. That's nothing but a lie, and you know it. I said, well, what are you going to do if it is a lie? I'm not going to do anything but chew your ass out and send you back to the unit. I said, okay. I said, I'm 18. <laughs> he said, okay. So they fixed my paperwork up, corrected my age, and sent me back to the unit. But they took a year's service away from me at that time. Still alone. I no longer had it. And... Uh, so the first sergeant, I went there and talked to first sergeant Pitt. He was my first sergeant B Company, uh, 325, and said, he said, uh, well, what, how'd they take a year away from you? Did you serve that? I said, yeah, in Korea. He said, they just took it away from you? I said, yeah, the people down personnel. He said, well, we'll get into this. And it went over the following day or the day after that, I got called around by the company commander. He said, you're getting your year back. <laughs> and he said, in addition to that, you're supposed to have been signed on jump status. You're going to get paid jump pay for that year, too. So I got it. I, I got my year given back to me, plus I got a year's jump pay. All right. And uh, I stayed in the 82nd till all this civil rights stuff started in the United States. You know, back in the 50s. Martin Luther King and his gang, and uh, they had to have a unit assigned for that purpose, fully on, fully armed and fully on with personnel and weapons and everything else to uh, send out to these rights. So I got sent to the 101st Airborne, uh, the 3 2, <clears throat> wait a minute, the 3, 3 2 5, 3 2 7. I was a 325 in 82nd. It's 327 in the, in the uh, 101st. And uh, we went out when there was a riot somewhere. Some of us was going to go. The first riot I was involved in was at Little Rock, Arkansas, high school. Oh, right. I was trying to it with uh, blacks. What year? This is 53? That was 55. Let me see. That was 55. 55, yeah. Yeah, yeah it was 55 because I had a... Gap and I didn't do nothing but go to school to get my high school diploma. All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and uh, anyway, fifty-five. Yeah, it had so to you dropped out of high school before all this. Oh yeah, I was okay. old enough to do anything else. And uh, they uh, let me go to school when I got down to Fort Bragg full time, and got my high school diploma from Alabama. From the University of Alabama. Well, from. Whatever, the Alabama State? Whatever, yeah, Alabama State. Okay. And uh, it actually had Athens on it. <laughs> high school diploma. And they was giving the people the opportunity to either go to school or get out. Well, I didn't want to get out, so I went to school. And uh, you had to go 
every day you couldn't take no leaves or nothing except Christmas and something special like that. Uh, and so I, I spent, it's a little over a year, uh, got my high school diploma. After that, I don't know, everything just, I got promoted. I got promoted again. So you're a staff sergeant now? Uh, I was a staff sergeant, but that's two rockers at that time. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, I know that. And uh, sergeant first class, uh, but you was a staff sergeant because there wasn't no one, there wasn't no three rockers, uh, three strikers. They was done away with. It. Went from corporal to one rocker. That was E5. Then E6 was two rockers. The, the old E5 was done away with. They just didn't have it. And they brought that back in in 58. Put the buck started back in place. So by 55, know. you're a sergeant first class? Mm-hmm. I was sergeant first class in 55. Okay, now time went on and I was with that duty of 101st. We went to interesting things like Little Rock, Arkansas. Yeah, tell me about that. I mean, that's Wa interesting. Watts, California. Detroit, Michigan. Where else we go? I, I went to a whole bunch of places with them folks. What'd you do at Little Rock? Uh, we blocked all the streets around the Central High School and didn't let no, anybody that was formed like a right come in the area. Now, didn't you have some conflict with the uh, the National Guard there? Wasn't oh, there? yes. Oh, yes. The National Guard there tried to uh, more or less tell us we didn't have no authority there. Well, we showed them we did have authority there. How'd you do that? We just we just took over the streets, picked Spanettes. They didn't know whether we had a weapons loaded or not. I think we did have. But uh, we had a weapons loaded. And if anybody tried to break through, and you you go to training how to block a street, you use a V formation to block a street. Well, if anybody tries to come down that formation, and here's Spanettes asking you like this, where are you going to attack them? Outside, yeah. You can't do it. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, we uh, spent about three weeks out there till the thing kind of ceased to be, and the, they decided they was going to let the blacks go to school after all. And we went back to Fort Campbell. Next one we went to, if I remember correctly, we went to Watts, California right after that. They was burning our neighborhood down out there. I never did understand that one. And then after that, who was burning the neighborhood down there? Huh? Who was burning the neighborhood down? The blacks. Oh, burning our neighborhood. Uh, because the government promised to replace these old buildings and everything, they didn't do it, so they just burned them down. Uh, the next place we went was uh, Detroit, Michigan. And that was up in the northern part of the city. And it was uh, a raggedy place up there. But they, too, was tearing their own neighborhood up. Now, the only people that they wouldn't attack or wouldn't attempt to attack was Oriental. The Orientals had restaurants and everything else. And I never seen a Oriental neighborhood attacked. Them blacks didn't want to fool with them Orientals. Because they'd come at them in numbers, and uh, they didn't, we didn't have to control areas where the Orientals was in there because they controlled them for us. So uh, what were you doing in these areas where they were just tearing up their neighborhoods? Huh? What did you do when they were tearing up the neighborhoods? What What was your job? To stop any disturbance that uh, might. Oh, okay. Start. I was a squad leader at that time, and uh, I did put my. Squad Go out on the street right here and say, nobody comes down that street. That's what we do. Oh, I see. Nobody can come down the street. Uh, and anyway, uh, they they first pulled the blacks all out of our unit and put them back down to armory down there, and then they put them back in with us. But at first they didn't they didn't trust the blacks hmm. against the riders. And I'm talking about the regular army blacks. I'm not talking about somebody else. And so they decided 
well, we got to trust them sometimes, so they put them back in the unit. And everything got okay. I, I don't know. We didn't have no problem. But, uh, we had some problems in Detroit. They uh, actually tried to attack some units in Detroit. And they got roughed up pretty good, but nobody got killed. Uh, we got on top of the buildings, going down to where they're trying to move down through here. They each just condoms and water. A condom a whole three gallons of water. You can throw that off of a building, and when it hits the ground, you'll think an artillery shield on it. <laughs> and that's what we had up there. And throw them off of the building, and it, whoom, that water goes everywhere. It, it broke up rice. I bet. And, and so we done the right control up there for about a week and a half, and back to Fort Campbell. Then we done some little ones, uh, smaller places. But that was the um, Watts, California, Little Rock, Arkansas, oh, University of Alabama. Got it. We was down to the University of Alabama, too. Hmm. George Wallace was going to stand in the door of the schoolhouse if they tried to let blacks come in to the University of Alabama. George Wallace did stand in the door of the schoolhouse. Federal government asked him to move under federal law, and he moved. What's he going, what's he going to do? And he got a lot of respect the way he done it. So you were there, you saw all that. Uh -huh. You were, you saw that? Oh yeah, we was there, we was looking at it. We, we was one <laughs> securing his, where he was. And, and uh, but anyway, the, the, I thought George Wallace, he done it right. He was a politician. The state di didn't want that school, or the schools in integrated. And George Wallace was the governor to do what the people of Alabama wanted him to do. And he done exactly that. And you know, after just a short while, and it seemed like months, but it must have been a couple of years, the blacks actually understood what George Wallace was trying to do. He was trying to ease them in as easy as possible without mm -hmm. And uh, the blacks had a lot of respect for George Wallace. But, uh, Anyway, that is the best I remember about the right control. And then we had a few more little ones, but it's more training than anything else. Want to take a break? Somebody out there. I think that's hell. Well, <clears throat> 55, 56, and the first, early 57, about finished right control because it had the States decided they would let the kids go to school and all that stuff. So the rock and roll kind of faded away somewhere there. Uh, look, Martin Luther King got faded away up in Memphis. That, hey, hey, hey. that uh, stopped rock and roll. And uh, other various things happened. But, but anyway, rock and roll kind of faded away. Then we uh, went into... Uh, Phase, the 101st went into a phase of, we was the first ready company in the world, uh, division rather, in the world on standby for any problems that the United States had anywhere. We had, uh, you know, the Army Mule, the, the little old mechanical mule? I think so, yeah. It's four, four wheel things, each platoon had one. We had that thing loaded with our ammunition. And we'd go out, you could drop it with you with the parachute. Uh -huh. And uh, we went through that phase of uh, actually would be between us and the Russians, I guess. If there was a, that much of a conflict between us and the Russians. But we was led to believe there was that much conflict between us and the Russians. I'm not too certain all that was true looking mm -hmm. back. But uh, I think it was us and the Russians as much as the Russians and us. It was kind of a two-way street day. Back to the riot control. Did you, did you ever see Martin Luther King? Huh? Did you ever see Martin Luther King? No. Oh, you ever saw him? At a distance. At a distance, one time. Uh, where was it? Oh, when they was on that Selma March. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> we was being held over the side of the road. We went on the road or we went off the road. We was where they crossed them bridges. Yeah. Okay, we had to line up on each side of the bridges when they come across. You come out into Montgomery? Uh, yeah, uh, out of Selma there before we go in. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I seen him then, but not up real close. He was uh, 50, 75 yards away. Because mm. as far as being an old buddy and shaking hands and talking, no, we never did do that. We. Anyway, Martin Luther King. I just uh, welcome to the Duncan household. <laughs> what is that? Oh shit! There she is. Is that you out there? That's me. Oh, okay, okay. Good. Yeah. Well, anyway, we, we finished that up of uh, the uh, rock control suddenly kind of faded away. Yeah, oh, if, I think it was probably politically motivated to start with. I don't really believe in there was that much of a rock control. It was just a bunch of black on the breaking stores and steel stuff. But, but anyway, that faded away after a few years. And uh, <coughs> I went during 56, late 56, 57, I went to Ranger School. Uh, I went to Jungle School. Uh, Tell me about Jungle School, what was that like? Huh? What was Jungle School like? Jungle School was kind of tough. I, uh, Where was it? Oh, in Panama, right off, off the, out of the Air Force Base there, down in the jungle. We had a camp down there. We had, uh, they had that one stream down with the, what's the fish he's attached? The piranha? Yeah. When the stream had that, we had to walk across the log, across that, across the log, across that log creek it was in. But we had one safety. We had a what, rope around the waist, <laughs> and they had a, two guys holding in the rope, and if you actually fell off the log, They'd have you clear of the water before the promise got you. <laughs> but you weren't sure. They might have been nibbling a little bit before they got you out of there. Yeah, yeah they could be. <laughs> but but uh, it's always the idea they're down there. Yeah. And, and they give you a little thing to throw in the water. When you went across, you're supposed to throw these little things in the water. And they give me uh, <laughs> his jerk is what it was. Yeah. A little piece of jerky about the big, throw it in the water, and you see the water go, Bloop, and it's gone. <laughs> and, <laughs> That'd be a crazy feeling. And, and then uh, some of the guys, they give them a rabbit, and uh, give some of them live fish. <laughs> and all I ever got is that little thing of jerky. But they'd throw a live rabbit in there, man, and it'd be, Coop, he's gone. Good gosh. Them, them, them news can... They can devour. I mean, they 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 something else. <laughs> but but anyway, we got through jungle school. Jungle school was a good little tough school, and they done away with it. They finally figured out it was a good little tough school, so they started up again. Did what was the a remedy for the bugs? What did you learn about bugs? How do you stop bugs from biting you? Oh, okay. Uh, Kenny, Kenny's taking notes. On you this. you uh, oh, you move in, set up your campsite, set up your poncho liner, have what you're sleeping under, and take your uh, insect repellent in little bottles. And just put your little ring right around, say this is your bunk or your sleeping area. Just put the little ring right around it like that, and bugs won't cross over that insect repellent. Neither with snakes, neither with uh, trans spiders. Hmm. You could you could feel kind of safe in inside that little. What about mosquitoes? Uh, you had, you well first of all we we buttoned up down here, and uh, then uh, you rubbed the mosquito repellent on the same stuff you put around here. Probably had you DDT in it then, didn't it? Huh? Probably had DDT in it back then. 
Well, I don't know. They they that was pretty good stuff. It it kept mosquitoes off of you. But the only problem is you go on your night patrol. That's when they would get you. Uh, bet. Uh, and uh, but as far as mosquitoes goes, the mosquitoes in Panama wasn't half as plentiful as them in Vietnam. In Vietnam, mosquitoes was awesome. Millions. We, we would actually, when we got near a rice paddy, we would actually slide down in the rice paddy and sleep with only a weapon laying up here and a head to expose and put the net on our head. So you're down in the water? Yeah. yeah. Get, on, get on that warm water, and you can sleep good on warm water. And uh, no mosquitoes would bother you. Mm. Don't turn over, because they get you. <laughs> <laughs> but mosquitoes, they, they, they attack anything, I think. What else was in Panama? Well, there's a lot of animals down there, a lot of panthers down there. And then the snakes, different snakes. They had a, a fuzzy snake, I forgot what to call it now. It grew pretty big and had like hair on it. Hair? Mm -hmm. It looked, like, looked more like fuzz than it did hair. Huh. Uh, what they call that snake? They had pan. Uh, they had pan. Uh, what's the big snake? Anaconda. Anacondas. They had pythons. Been, they had both down. There wasn't many pythons, but there was anacondas. But them big snakes don't run around here attacking people like you think. Uh, you got to do something to them before they bother you. But that fuzzy snake. He had a little poison in him, too. If he bit you, he had to get some medical help. Uh, what they call that snake? Anyway, they had little raccoons and uh, had, had some monkeys. Uh, and a lot, I don't know why so many panthers. They had a lot of panthers there. Uh, I never seen no... Uh, Tiger, or any member of the tiger family, let me say, in, in Panama. I've seen some in Vietnam, but not in Panama. Uh, and uh, they had some big animals, like they had a few zebras down there. I don't know how they got there. <laughs> they just run kind of wild around there. Uh, and what else? A few of the large, I guess these big monkeys would be in the rock uh, rock class of the like the rock eight mm. would be in that class because they them big old monkeys they had three fifty four hundred pound monkeys mm. great big monkeys like like the ones I've seen by now but there weren't many of them there's not many of them kind of monkeys living no more. That's a, that's what to say, yeah. But fish they had every fish in the book. It's it's nice to go fishing if you get a chance down there. Just except for the piranhas, I didn't. Even, if I hook one of them dudes, I didn't want to take him off the hook. I just gave him the hook and let him go. Yeah. <laughs> Is there any way to know if there's piranhas in the water? Oh yeah. So before yeah. you walk through it or something. Oh yeah, we had them areas of piranhas in identified. They don't get in every stream around there. They'll stick to the stream that they're in. That's that's it. You uh, just don't want to find one accidentally, do you? No. You you just find it once, probably. I heard they're good eating. Uh, I heard they're good eating. They're real thick. They're real wide. They Love they are they that yeah. Make make some good fillets. You could you could you could uh, live in the jungle pretty easy down there. Enough stuff in there. A lot of berries down there. More berries than. The average place has got uh, just stuff you can eat. You just got to know what to look for and what the divine tells you. You take a vine and break it and milk it. And if you actually get something that looks like milk coming out of there, you don't eat that. That's poisonous. Mm. But if it's got watery look coming out, it's okay to eat. But uh, there they was a lot of food out in the jungle that 
I don't know, that's, that place has always been occupied by civilized people. And civilized people don't normally try to live off the jungle or off the land. They bring food in. So that's the reason there's so much stuff out there in the jungle to eat. You could just, you could live off the jungle, no problem. Uh, the only, only real danger I've seen other than jumping over the jungle, was when we jumped, and we jumped pretty close to that darn stream had the frogs in. <laughs> and, and I always wondered what would happen if the wind caught us and blowed us in that stream. <laughs> there, it wasn't a big stream. That stream wasn't off from here, that house over there. Not that big. It's big enough to worry about. Oh, yeah. I'm <laughs> telling you. <laughs> And there, uh, we'd go for one day's uh, introduction to the jungle and then take us down to <coughs> that little pond and they'd put some kind of little animal on a stick <coughs> and have a fork stick up there like that and take that stick here and just put him down there. And nothing happened at first, and all of a sudden the water looked like it started to boil. And then you bring them up in about 20 seconds, nothing but a skeleton. Man. It's, it's like that, they just strip them a body. <laughs> uh, now the, I'm talking about what they found. The, there's a, a little raccoon or a rabbit or, you know, whatever they had available. Chicken a few times. <laughs> he didn't have a fit one. Oh man. <laughs> I'd have a fit myself if I was tied on that stick. <laughs> That'd be a good uh, routine to get some information out of somebody. Yeah. <laughs> Start on his toes and then you won't, you won't I think I'd tell him anything you want to know if I seen him for long time. <laughs> we had a boy. We went down. Anytime I had any kind of uh, problems in Panama, the 82nd had sent somebody down to put it down. And uh, we went down there one time. I forgot what the problem was this time, but anyway, we landed out there, and this guy got a piranha, put it, got it in a jar, and brought back to Fort Bragg. And boy, they were going to court martial him. I bet. <laughs> and it's, it's against international law to bring them things across oh. out of that border. And they're going to call Marsh now for doing that. But it's still alive? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Still alive. He's like, let me out. <laughs> See, that's fresh water them things are in. It's not salt water. It's like, put yeah. me in the Tennessee River. That's what he was thinking. You wouldn't want to? Yeah. <laughs> oh, they'd, you'd see them catfish give up life down there. <laughs> All right, so where, where'd you go after jungle school? Well, let me see. I went from jungle school... Well, let me see. I went to jungle school before I went to ranger school. All right. Then I went to ranger school. Where was this? That was in 58. Yeah, 58. Where Where are you now? Oh, that's in Fort Benning, Georgia. So you're in Fort Benning, That's only right. ranger school. That's yeah. right, yeah. Fort Benning, Georgia. I went to ranger school. I went to a couple of NCO academies, you know, get something on your records that they can use for promotion. And... Uh, then after that, what was I signed? Well, I went up to Alaska and was signed to the 508 uh, winterized team that taught people how to ski and stuff like that. Hmm. And I stayed up there for, oh, I don't know, uh, about, about six months, I guess. Not a very good place to be. No mosquitoes, though. No mosquitoes? No, they don't have <laughs> And uh, you you test winter equipment, what you do. So you were you were up there just skiing and in fatigues. Yeah, just having a good time. Just just having a good time. Did you have to do anything uh, army like? <laughs> well, the army would send units up there for training, and we'd uh, be the aggressors, the enemy against them. See. Oh, okay. And we'd jump out there and we'd mess them up as all we could in the snow and. Then have to go out and pick them all up later. 
Uh, but it, it was it was pretty good. But she, you living out in pretty rugged living. You got Jane Way Hunch, uh, Quonch, uh, Jane Way Hutch, and that's a low double insulated uh, tent about big as this room here. And you got the hint ten for it, so you you're pretty well, you're in pretty good shape in it. Uh, then you you don't get nothing for that except cold butt, and then after a while you do your time up there and come back to the unit. My unit at that time was the hundred first, and I get sent back to that. Uh, and a few years I just I went back to Germany for. A, about a year, come back to the state in Germany. Uh, I was went over to uh, as a part of the 509th Airborne, which later become part of the 24th Infantry Division. And then they signed of all all of us. It was signed over there to that unit was sent over to uh, well 10th Special Force Camp down at Batos, and. Uh, we worked down there. I don't know. We, didn't, I don't really know. Don't really remember ever being assigned to them people. Mm. But we worked for them. And so finished that. Back to Fort Campbell. And uh, then the Korean War started heating up. Uh, the Vietnam War started heating up. Well, first one regiment. From 101st went down there. As far as we was concerned, at Fort Campbell, one regiment went to Vietnam. There was other units there, but that was one of our regiments went over there. And uh, then they start start drawing a few people in at a time, you know. And eventually, I made my first trip to Vietnam in '65. What and rank were you? I was sergeant first class, sorry, but I've been promoted. I, I was sort of first class E seven men. I was sort of, I was sort of first class E six before. That's that picture where I was promoted that. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That's that picture. And anyway, a uh, lot of training and stuff. And I uh, went over to Vietnam, spent a tour, and come back to Fort Campbell. Didn't do a whole lot, as I remember. What was your first tour like? I don't know. It was. Uh, I don't know, it, it wasn't too exciting, I didn't think. But the second tour was. The first tour, I don't know, we'd shoot at the VC and it shoot at us. Uh, we had them so outnumbered, they, they couldn't hurt us. But uh, then the North Vietnamese moved in, they were pretty good troops. We, uh, <coughs> most, most all the people was over there then, got sent back, and then 60, damn, get my years mixed up, that was 65, 66, <coughs> yeah, <coughs> okay, in March of 67, I went back to Vietnam, and was <coughs> no longer signed to the 101st percent I was signed to the uh, 173rd Airborne. 173rd Airborne was a reactionary force for Mac B. Mac B was a control element unit for Vietnam, all of Vietnam. And uh, the, the uh, Mac B uh, security force was us. Anytime anybody got in trouble, we went. And uh, we also started a jungle school, and we'd been to jungle school. Found out why they had sent us a few years before. We started jungle school uh, for incoming personnel. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, that we went there full time. We were just there part of the time doing that. And I don't know, we done various little missions out there. And, uh, the Hunter First was by far the better unit I was ever in. Then that finished up that tour. and uh, Tell me more about that tour. Huh? Tell me more about that tour. Is well, that yeah. when you came across orangutans and all? All the different animals and different things? Oh, in, in Vietnam? Well, they had 
They had a lot of animals in Vietnam, more than you'd believe. They had tribes of orangutans, monkeys. Now, orangutan looks a lot like a chimp, chimpanzee, except he walks upright. He don't, he don't walk on to it. <coughs> and, they're, <coughs> and they're real intelligent. And for instance, we was moving along and all of a sudden we thought there's a snipe up in the tree, so everybody cut down on it. Rangatangs started falling out of the tree. We were killing monkeys. Well, them rangatangs just disappeared. That night, them rangatangs got out there in the jungle and anything they get their little paws on, they throw them at us all night long. <laughs> and the <laughs> next day they were gone. <coughs> but boy, they're mad at them. They had to go bury their dead. Huh? <laughs> well, man, they, they, I mean, they, they could throw a rock. And, and so, I'm not talking about a hundred orangutans, I'm talking about more like maybe a thousand, or a bunch of them. They grew big groups. Uh, now, worried, uh, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of black panthers in, in Vietnam. And uh, they, they would, when they had the little ones, they would move into a group and build like a bird's nest on the ground. It's a great big stick nest. And that's where they had their little ones in. You didn't want to walk in that uh, Black Panther uh, village because they'd attack you. Mm -hmm. So you had to really be watchful and carefully that you didn't run into that. We knew basically where there was, but uh, you can't kind of wander off into it if you don't watch it. But the Panthers, they had <coughs> some lions and tigers, but there weren't many of them. They had a few elephants. <coughs> the Indian elephant with the big ears. They had the Indian elephant, uh, they had the rock ape. The rock ape weighs again four to five hundred pounds. They big, but there wasn't a lot of them. They, and they and they use it by themselves. You don't see them in groups. Did you ever see one of those apes get a hold of somebody? One time, one time, a guy shot at one up there. Didn't hurt him on thing, but the but the rock ape grabbed him, throwed him up here, and throwed him there. <laughs> Finally, they kept shooting up there. The old rock ape run off. <coughs> they never did kill him. <coughs> but that guy was hospitalized. I bet. He did. beat the shit out of that guy. <laughs> but they... You uh, have a deal with the elephants? Huh? The enemy using the elephants to come at you? Oh, the elephants won't attack you. They, they won't attack you without... This movie stuff is movie stuff. Elephants won't bother you if you don't bother them. But they use them to haul their Oh, they use them to haul stuff. stuff. Yeah. They, you can get a truckload of stuff on the elephants back. We ambushed. We was on. We had, in addition to the whole unit of the 173rd being a reactionary force, you had units within the battalion that was first reactionary force. <coughs> we, was, we was on a, on a, uh, what? There's all. Huh? There's your vitamins. Oh. Huh, huh, huh. There, there. That paint's that bread is on. Okay. Where's my vitamins? You want some too? Oh. Uh, that one said you'd be here at 10 after. Give me, give me, give me. Give me a sour sugar. That must be. That woman. Anyway, we were sitting waiting for the word to go. Had our all our equipment. Waiting for the shoppers to come in. Shoppers come in. We board board shoppers and head out there about four or five miles up in the jungle. And two companies, her company and B company, they sit up on this side of the hill, we sit up on this side of the hill, and the, the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese, with three elephants, 
come down the trail. Well, funny thing about this, when it all started, we got a report from a uh, one of our. I just want a little bit to get. You'll get a little bit. That's yeah. good. That's good. Thank you. You'll get the whole thing. To get this. Uh, you want some? What do you want? <laughs> anyway, we got the report from uh, the uh, back which our forward observer got that little airplane. He reported three elephants moving down the trail north of Dock Shoal about five miles, and they're red. Everybody said. He must have got drunk last night. <laughs> there ain't no such thing as a red elephant. So they sent a fact, uh, a, uh, what the, the Air Force, what they call air. They got the same thing we got, that low airplane. He went up there, flew around, gave the same report back. He sees three elephants loaded with something. And it looked like a puma platoon or maybe two platoons of men with them. So, time for us to go into action. So they got our two companies out there, lined them up, choppers come in. We jumped on the chopper and went up there, short of where they was, and in down here, grade from where they're moving, so they run to us. And B company's up over here, we're up over here. And here they come, down that draw. Three red elephants, sure as hell was red. <laughs> and we sat there, everybody sat there, what were we gonna do? Shoot them? Red elephant? I ain't never heard of red elephant. So we we started shooting at them. We killed one elephant. We shot another one four or five times, never did kill that dude, so we took an anti tank up and knocked him down. <laughs> and then we over and killed him. Half we, got, half we got them, they had the loads of uh, equipment like guns, weapons, and food and stuff like that on them. Just use them. Well, let's, well, let's do this right here. Come on in. Okay. How y'all doing? Hello, hello. Can I sit right here? Like the elephants. Huh? The elephants. Oh, coming okay. down. Oh. They were red. We got, we ready? Yep. We got on the helicopters and off we went up to set up an ambush for the elephants and the bed con. Well, when we landed and everything, of course, we moved down this way to the jungle, opposite where they're coming. And they moved on down. So we got all the people in position. And <clears throat> sure enough, there comes Three red elephants, bigger than life, down that trail. Uh, so we started to shoot them up. It was hard to kill an elephant. Okay, the first one we put enough firepower in to blow him up. He had ammunition, no doubt. We blowed him up. We killed all the uh, personnel. There's about 30-something well-armed North Vietnamese soldiers. And we, we got them real quick. That was our first mission, get them, then get the elephants. And so we got the first elephant. The second one, we crippled him, but we couldn't kill him. He just wouldn't die. And so guy got down with an M7, uh, a uh, anti-tank weapon, a anti-tank weapon. It's about like a bazooka, but not quite as large as a 66 millimeter we had. Got close to him, shot him right in the ear, and killed him. I bet. And uh, so he fell. The other one's still on his feet, though. We started shooting him. I seen two M60 machine guns empty a belt of ammunition into that elephant's head, and he's still moving. Oh, wow. I mean, you can't kill an elephant like that. They just won't die. Mm. And anyway, we kept putting a power on him, killed him. 
took all the, the, the two, he didn't blow the stuff up on two of them. They had <clears throat> like a truckload of ammunition on each one of them elephants. Well, we got all the ammunition, we called in choppers, hauled out, hauled out the ammunition, and then we moved on out. And uh, that about ended that little fight. Uh, I'll see, am I on my second or third? Your second year. Second. Okay. Then we, uh, after that, moved back. We're still on this Raxton Airport. We was always on the Raxton Airport. We moved back into Dock Toll. Dock Toll was what we was working out of. That's way up near Play Cool, the Highlands up there. And uh, we had several little fights like that. But then we started, the North Vietnamese were preparing for Tet of 68, even though we back in 67. They was going to cut Vietnam into somewhere or another. They thought they was. Going to cut Vietnam into right there because that was, a, Vietnam goes like that. Slim right here. Mm -hmm. And they was going to cut into before Tet. Well, they sent us up there because we was a better reactionary force than anybody else they knew of yet. So our job was to stay, they didn't do that. So we started running patrols, running patrols, hitting them with air power, whatever we could do. And uh, then we started getting into big fights. Well, the first big fight wasn't the company I was in, it was A Company. They lost 76 men, 76 out of one company. And the company's only got 160 something men. Wow. That's a lot of, a lot of mm -hmm. folks. Well, we got up there and rescued what was left. Uh, but uh, got the bodies out and everything. But from men on, they, they, we was taking prisoners after that we quit. We quit taking prisoners. Get them. Uh, so we uh, went on and on and on on that. Now this was in, uh, say, July and August. That the, beer, the fight was building, building, building. Well, somewhere around October, it had built. Every time he went out, you got hit heavy. They got hit heavy. Uh, we bought to call in the airstrikes, blow them up, get rid of them, burn them up, get napalm in them. Well, this went on and on and on. Then the rainy season started again. Rainy season starts what we fall here. Well, it's harder to fight a war in the rain than it is in dry weather. Oh, yeah. And and this this is we talking about mountains. We're not talking about flatland. We're talking about like this. I mean, we'd actually to get across those little things that were streams before the rainy season started. What we'd have to do, one good swimmer would dive in the lake with a rope tied around him, and they'd pull him across the water. Okay, he's on the other side now with a rope. He'd tie the rope in, and then we'd start feeding him more rope across, and get three ropes across there, then we'd carry people across on the rope, rope bridge. Oh, well. Uh, and it's better than taking a chance of losing your people because you take a mountain stream like that and that water coming down like that, you can lose some people real fast. Mm -hmm. So uh, that went on, this kind of fighting. And, uh, not, they didn't fight much at night, the North Vietnamese didn't. They didn't know the country no better than we did, so they didn't fight much at night. And we had another disadvantage up there, too. The, the maps we were using was old French maps. Well, the old French maps shows uh, the elevation in relief, but not like ours, exactly. A French map will come up like this, and then it'll go down like this. Well, they don't do it like that. So we call around then, and all of a sudden, where'd he go? It disappeared. It was falling in this valley here instead of over here where it should. So we we had to kind of retrain ourselves on them maps. And finally we got some better maps in, but 
Emma saw him out from the first hand. <laughs> and, Leave it to the French. And so we uh, <clears throat> went on and on, and about October, last October, the, the fight really picked up, really picked up. We would go out, we'd get hit or hit them every day. And uh, we, we got pretty good at hitting them before they hit us. But, but uh, we'd hit them every day. Then, what they call the Battle of Doc Toe. Mm -hmm. That was a biggie. It was almost, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't Tet, this wasn't Tet, this was before Tet now. Tet is in uh, January, today it would be Tet New Year. Well, yesterday it would be Tet New Year over there. Hmm. Well, we were back in uh, November now. So we done the, the fight with them for oh, about a month there. And then uh, we're into January now. So they really moved the people in then because they was going to take that uh, strip of land up there. Well, they didn't get it. Now, we, we uh, got them up there, got the air power back here and we here in this little narrow strip and got them trapped right there. They can't go their way and they can't come our way. So we shot people, shot people. And finally, uh, what they call the Battle of Doc Toll, and Hill 813, Hill 875, particularly 875, we, we got them dudes trapped. Uh, intelligence reports said that we killed over 2,000 of them in that action. Now, we're talking about a four day period. And they killed about 40, 50 of our people. But, uh, they done. They was. They couldn't go back to Gambodia. They couldn't come our way. If it went back to Gambodia, the planes would get. If they come our way, we'd get them. So we had a pretty good trout there. And uh, so finally, we just killed so many of them. A few of them got away. And we kept shooting them and kept shooting them. And then after they moved over the border. We called the planes in and got them over there too. <laughs> uh, and then that part of the fight was over with, actually, they thought. So the North Vietnamese moved back, what was left of uh, up there in that area, moved back over into Cambodia. Of course, we weren't allowed to cross that border. And uh, Christmas passed. January went away just about, and then the fighting started getting big. Here it is, Tet now. Well, in Tet, we were feeling pretty good. We thought, well, we, out, we ain't going to get in this fight. Well, it come along about the 20th day of Tet New Year, Tet January. It started big time. So we was up there somewhere, and I don't remember where in the jungle. They picked us up and carried us into the uh, Tom Key Air Base down there because they was trying to hold on it. So we went in there and shot it up with them, and they was, we caught them out in the open. They didn't expect us in there. And we really caught them out there in the open and done them in. And so we thought, well, we finished for this fight. <laughs> well, next, next day come. No, we're not finished for this fight. We got to go into another one. So we went to Saigon. Well, they had took the embassy down there. The North Vietnamese had took the embassy. Well, we went in there to take it back. The first companies that went in got so much ground power, they pulled them out. We landed right outside of where we was going to get them made a new plan. Uh, my battalion was going behind and on top of the embassy. Second battalion was coming in the front, give support and fire. Uh, so the, the people on top of the buildings, they built building about five, five stories high. People on top of the building, we on top of them building pretty easy, but the ones on the back lost some people. 
because they didn't suspect the people was trying to get on top of that. Now them them <coughs> roofs are made out like a uh, old British, uh, old French curl stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. You can see through it, but it protects you from rain. Well, we got up there and just bust the hole so it got in. And we up on in the attic now. <laughs> working our way down. And if we would get a floor down, we'd put a flag out the window. So they know on the ground how far we was down there. Uh, my company, a C Company, 4th Battalion, and the A, no, no, B Company. C Company and B Company was on the roofs. Uh, D Company and A Company was down on the ground directing the fire of the people on the ground. That's where we was. <clears throat> they directed them with the uh, tracer bullets. And freight bullets and threw that under us. Mm -hmm. So we fought that fight and it went on all day just about. But we found clear the building out. And the uh, way we'd really clear them out, we'd come down there and holler in English as anybody in that room. And if they went away, so we'd start chunking hand grenades in there. <laughs> and, and blow it, what's in there up? So this went on and on, and we come down. Finally took the embassy back, and, and we moved out. And that kind of ended what I was involved in in Tet New Year. But after, I, it was time for me to go on R&R. &R. I left there and went to Hawaii <laughs> and stayed over there for a week. And the time I got back, that fight was over with. Uh, it was about over with for a left. <clears throat> but then along come another big fight. And, uh, well, they was going pretty good there through April, May, and June. It all started over again. Hail raising. It's going. But, uh, this went on till said when? Late that year, not, not the end of the year. January, February. Must have been October. October, yeah. I left that now and come back to Fort Bend in Georgia. And stayed down there. And they assured me, you know, I'm gonna have to go back to Vietnam because yeah, the president Nixon just signed a thing that says if you've been to Vietnam more than once, you don't have to go back. Well, I'm sitting down there in the November, same year now, November, I got orders to go to Vietnam. <laughs> and uh, I said, shit fire. The president said I didn't have to go back. <laughs> so I called up my branch from Washington. And I told him, I said, well, we'll check it out. At that time, I was had been moved to first sergeant. They said, we'll check it out and get back to you. Well, the next day they called me up from DA and said, yeah, we, we got your orders. You've been there twice. But says, you are a regular army soldier. Now he's talking about the draftees. He's not talking about you people. <laughs> so off I went come 11th of December. I'm on my way back to Vietnam again. Got over there, but I wasn't going to be assigned a frontline unit. I'm going to get a real echelon job. I said, well, shit, that'll be all right. So I got over there and went down to Cameron Bay, which is way down south there. And uh, everything was looking pretty good, and I stayed down January, February, and March. Part of March, they tried to overrun Cameron Bay. Of course, we went out there and prevent that. And uh, we, we got some real big fights right then. They was coming out, they had the, the uh, uh, Hawk Missile Battalions, and there are two of them in there. And they come in and tried to take them, and we had to protect them Hawk Missiles. So we let them get on the beach 
and then we'd bring the fireflies in, which is a helicopter with the with the beacons on. Get them on the beach and uh, get them. They were coming in by boat. Yeah, they come in sand pants, fishing boats. They actually around like a round basket. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and and we got them on, got them on the beach. And uh, but the thing they didn't know was we had. Well, they had not. We had pulled the, the uh, Hawk missiles off the beach completely. They were well over somewhere else. And they was coming into them bunkers and everything that had been built by the Hawk people, but there weren't no Hawk That's missiles in it. Huh. And, and so we called them right up there dead-handed in them empty Hawk buildings. And they didn't want to give up. So we just... Blowed them up and blowed the buildings up and everything else. And uh, eliminated that fighting as a, shot, as a war area. And they moved out what there was left of them and, and got out of there. We captured some of them. Some of them we didn't capture, just got them. And they moved out. Uh, and let me see. What happened next? <clears throat> we got some pretty good little fights after that, but nothing like these in Docto. Because we, we, we lost in Docto from uh, October, November, November, October, November. My battalion lost about 700 men. We killed the wounded. Mm. And that's a bunch of people. Yep. So uh, it is. You got anyway, but the the North Vietnamese lost a whole lot more than that. They got an intelligence report from wherever they get them from. It said on that battle on the hill A seven five that we killed over nine hundred uh, over twenty nine hundred North Vietnamese. And that's a lot of folks. Mm -hmm. Now of course they got I believe it was 800, around 800 hours killed and wounded. But there's more wounded than there was killed. Because we could get a wounded out, get a medical care in just a little while. They couldn't do that. But that about ended my, yeah, that about ended my Korean War third tour right there. Come back to the States, I had made Sergeant Major at the time, were you a sergeant major in Vietnam? Yeah, I made it for a left. And, but I didn't know it. Huh. Didn't know it. They had sent my orders over there and sent them to the wrong unit. And the administration wasn't too good over there for a while. So I was, they knew I was on the list for sergeant major, so I was doing a sergeant major's job, even though I didn't have the promotion at the time. So I, uh, Got the promotion, come back, <clears throat> went from here. A direct return from Vietnam to Germany. No stop in between. <clears throat> that was at my request. And uh, stayed up in Germany for, I don't know, two more years, I guess. Where were you in Germany? Oh, at that time I was in Wiesbaden in the 509th Airborne. And uh, stayed in Germany there for a couple of years, but... Uh, when did you start training with the other paratroopers, like French paratroopers? And Didn't you train with some English paratroopers and stuff? Huh? You trained with some other, like you had... Oh yeah, you know, everybody, everybody was with me, was in the Airborne. Yeah. I didn't move out here just anywhere. I moved out with other Paratroopers. Well, when did you get your wings from, like, didn't you get wings from England and France and Germany? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, when I, when I got to Germany this time, All right. uh, I went over there and the first job I had was I took my company down to show the Germans how to set up a uh, jump area. They, did, they, they was trying to get their troops back into the Airborne units built, and they didn't know exactly how to build 
the jump tower and all that other stuff. So we got the equipment there, and we went there and actually built a uh, jump school former with their help. Mm. And uh, then uh, we got the job of when there was a space capsule went up. Our unit was the only airborne unit could do the job out of Europe or close in. Uh, they had an alternate landing, uh, alternate uh, landing zone right out of rock when the Sahara Desert out there. Well, that's so if a capsule, they couldn't get it out of that part of the world, they could land it there in the Sahara Desert. But they had to secure where they was going to land it mm -hmm. for well in advance. Well, we was people that was going to secure them. So we had gone there and we practiced and practiced. And anyway, uh, they give us the first battalion of the French Foreign Legion is fighting partners. Uh, and because they had reason being is because the French Foreign Legion had spent a lot of time in that part of the world. But what people don't know about the Foreign Legion is the Foreign Legion was more German than it was French. That's right, yeah. And so anyway, we got in there and we worked with the French Foreign Legion. Never did get a capsule to come down there, but we were there each time <laughs> uh, ready for them. And uh, it worked out pretty good, I thought. Then I, I went to, uh, well, we automatically got the German wings because we were on operations with them. I mean, the French wings. Now, the German wings, we had a, the German battalion with us as a co-partner up in Germany. So we went to their jump school, they went to their jump school back and forth. Oh, yeah. And that's where I got the German wings. Now on the uh, British wings, <coughs> I, <coughs> I went to uh, Scotland. They had a school up in Scotland. I went to Scotland and got the British wings. Okay, on the uh, French wings, that was the German, I mean the French Foreign Legion, it was with us, was responsible for me having them wings. Okay. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, the, you, you either went on operations with them and got the wings, or you went to their school and got the wings. That's what it amounted to. And I mostly went to their school on two of them, and two of them I went on operations with them. Uh, and uh, it, it was interesting, very interesting, working with them foreign troops. Well, I went to do some jumps with the French, and they got some weird stuff. They <laughs> they they go flying out through there, and they had C-123 aircraft, and they'd go flying out through there, and when it came time to jump, the red light would come on. Okay, everybody stand up and hook up. Check the equipment. When the green light come on, that outdoor the wind. No more checks. But the Germans, just like us, every man checks a man in front of you. Turn around, every man checks a man behind you. And then you're ready to go. <coughs> the, uh, let me see, the French. Okay, the, the, the uh, Vietnamese. I actually won't operate with them a lot. I gotta go get rid of a little bit more of that medicine then. Boy, that shit puts out of it. <laughs> Man. American Infantry, everybody in the American Infantry wears it. If you even the American Infantry, you wear that rope. Well, what is this spread out? This is your last. Lord. This is your last unit, like. That being the last unit, this is a, the crest, and that's the unit patch that you have. Of course, over here's all American decorations. I got nine North Stars right here. See that one, shiny? Mm -hmm. That's worth five, and then them others. Now, 
all them all them blonde stars except one was with a B. Okay, this in here, that's air metals. And what you, we got air metals for, we had to do 25 air assaults into enemy territory to get one air metal. All right. We, I got two, two and a half, really. And this other oh, that's why it says a two on there. Uh, yeah, okay, that's, what's on there? Two, yeah. Okay, that was 50, that showed 50 air assaults into That's my total amount of time in bed now. But you did more than 50. Oh, you yeah. You just didn't oh, do yeah. over 75. I done like more in the 60s. And uh, that's that's quite a few uh, decorations. That's the highest reward you can get as retired. And when you retire, you can get that. Uh, that with the palm, that's across the gallery with the palm. That's the highest award you can get in, in the cross gallery. And that little thing, what you call this, is the same thing, really. Uh, that's presidential unit citations. This right here, that is the highest citation that the United States gives a unit. When all the people in the unit should have got the superstar, you can't do that. So they give them the cross of gallery. Okay. Uh, and that is the Vietnamese presidential unit citation. And that's the Korean unit citation. And that's the McPhee in country in, in Vietnam. I guess that's all of them. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. Anyway, last year, you know, it's all these things got all these hash marks. Last year they changed all that. Okay, you call about hash marks is on the right. Each one of them represents six months in online there with the combat unit. And then your year's service is on the left. Well, when the first change to the blue uniform from the green, uh, you had like that. Okay. Uh, now, when you see these little stars right here on the, on the ribbon, each one of the stars represents one campaign. In other words, it can be <coughs> from a month to six months, but it's one campaign. Each one of these little stars right here. Okay, now I have uh, one civil one, which one civil one represents five. Uh, the, gold, the, the bronze one represents one campaign each. Uh, now, the, the, that's not to do with the uh, bronze star. The bronze star, that is five, and the other four is one each. And the, the V meant that I got all of them except one. Actually, one wasn't for Valor. You get them for, for Valor. For mm -hmm. And uh, that's about it with them. The rest of these are campaign ribbons. I got a few more of them. You probably got those everywhere. Uh, you probably have those campaign ribbons everywhere. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah I got them. When they issue you campaign ribbons, They send these to you. And on the back of it is your name. So That's a bronze star, right? Yeah, it's a bronze star, right. That's nine bronze stars. Wow. And uh then this is the, uh, damn, I can't think of what it is. 
this that's their medal. <laughs> that's Colonel Painswood in Vietnam. Uh, that right there is the army, army, army. Well, oh, shit. Accommodation, accommodation medal. Should have a name on that one too. Yeah. There you go. Mm -hmm. Any anything that's got a dollar attached to it, your name will be on the back of it. This one, I got a couple more boxes or somewhere. Oh yeah, here's some. Uh, that's a World War II occupation ribbon. Now you've been from 1947 to 1953, and you get that. Or either you get that for Japan and that for Germany. And that's the UN ribbon. Got that for being there. Now, on these right here, this is a good conduct medal. Okay, each one of them ties means additional good conduct medals. You get one every four years. And, yeah, it's got my name on it. And any of these, that, okay, this right here, it's supposed to have a star here. That, <coughs> There's an Army Defense, which for every war you in, you get one of these medals, that one. And this is for the uh, Korean War, that you just get one for, for the war itself, <clears throat> and that's for the Vietnam War. And I got a few more in there, that's, of course I said that's the Air Medal, the Korean campaign, uh, the uh, Vietnamese. Campaign. They send each one of these in a little bubble box like that right there, but I seem to misplace some of my bubble boxes. Oh well, they'll keep in there. Right? And uh, they, they send them to you. Yeah, you can't. You can wear them with the uniform if you want to. But they're too heavy. Yeah. You can tear your uniform up. Yeah, I've got I've got the little miniature ones to wear with the uniform. But you you can't wear that many heavy. That <coughs> one or two, yeah. But when you get them all the way across, you like that. <laughs> so. Anyway, that's decoration. Did you ever get hurt in Vietnam? Oh yeah! Oh yeah! I never did get shot. I dived in a hole the day before Thanksgiving of 1940, uh, 1967. I dived in a hole, flattened out. A guy dived on top of me and he took his back off. Oh, you were lucky there. Another time, I was in a hole looking out and this guy climbed in with me and he got hit right here and almost took his whole shoulder off. He's right, he's right there now, here. Uh, this other guy though, he was right here. Here was our head right here. Being like that, he's dead. Uh, and uh, I don't know, there's so many times that I could have got wiped out and didn't. Uh, I had a, uh, in, uh, on Hill 875, there was a sniper up in the tree shooting. Nobody could locate him. And then somebody s seen the smoke from his weapon up in the tree. They shot several times, but he got on the other side of the tree and they couldn't get him because it was up behind there. <coughs> there. Uh, line. Okay, I took a mortar tube, a 60 mortar tube. You know, they're not very big. I took this mortar tube, stuck in the ground. I said, okay. Had this boy Gates, I said, drop me around then. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> Went over him. I pulled up a little bit and I said, okay, drop me another round. <laughs> Boom! Went under him. I said, okay, give me another round. Boom! Blow him from out the tree. <laughs> Got him. <laughs> 
So you never you never got hurt really in Vietnam. It sounds like never did. I got my ears got blown out almost, but boys getting shot, hit, or anything, never got hit. I got blown down with concussion and stuff like that. But I'm talking about bullet type. Uh, I don't know. Just I was out there trying to save my people and actually save myself. That's yeah. Uh, now when I, when we would move into area, the first thing I'd make them do was dig in. And at first when the new guys they kinda of get irritated at you, but after they see one day where they hit them at night, you have no more trouble. <laughs> <coughs> when we moved up on Hill eight seven five <clears throat> which is the biggest battle that we had there in Docto. We moved up on a hill. We had been in a, in a constant battle for about four days. And uh, they pulled us back to send us up on the hill 875 because 2nd Battalion had a battalion trapped up on a hill. So we moved up there. By the time we got there, it's pitch black. So what we done, we pulled, you know what box fire is, right? No, I don't. It, it shines, it glows in the dark. It's on trees. And we pull this box valve and stuck it on the back of our helmet so we could see each okay, other. Yeah. And uh, moved on up there, we got up there. But moving up there, we kept running into bodies laying there. We have to stop checking bodies because it might be Americans and it might be North Vietnamese trying to play dirty poo with you. So you'd go over there and take your flashlight, you know, with the dim, the seal over it, down like that, look at his helmet. If that didn't give him weight, check his forehead, you could tell about that. And if it was a Vietnamese, <coughs> ban it. <laughs> <laughs> and move on out. But we uh, we moved up there and there was half a dozen Vietnamese trying to play little games on side of the trail. As soon as the last person, they detect the last person coming up, they'd start hitting them in the rear. Yeah. But anyway, uh, we uh, uh, got up there about <coughs> 2 o'clock in the morning and I think it was about 2, it was, it was still night. But uh, gathered all the people, we could gather up, wounded and Everything of a second battalion got them in the middle of us and then started moving the wounded on uh, them rain trees had big old roots come up like that. You can actually walk under them rain trees. Mm. And so we started moving all their, their wounded on them rain trees. So indirect fire couldn't hit. And uh, about daylight, they started hitting us again. And anyway, we uh, we had a pretty good fight there. We had a pretty good fight there until about noon the next day. And then they withdrew back to the like seven five. I'll have to let you have a tape sometime. You have, have you ever seen that tape? I don't know. Maybe I have. I don't know. Uh, Anyway, uh, we uh, kept using air power on them. We, we called the air strike after air strike there. <clears throat> they're so dug in up there, you could drop a bomb on them, but they just run down them tunnels. And... So we attacked them just about noon. But man, they was cutting their people down so much, we had to withdraw back down the hill. Because they had us outnumbered. Many, many to many, many. And uh, we uh, withdrew back down the hill about 3 o'clock. Somebody made a decision going, hit them again. <coughs> Brought all the air strike, we'd get in there real fast. Then we took off up the hill again. Well, this time we got them. We got all the way top of the hill before they could do anything about it. And uh, we, the few that was left alive up there, Got a court, they, they were up against the gun, Cambodian border. The few that was left alive up there, 
we uh, pretty well got them wiped out real fast. And, uh, never did take no prisoners up there on that hill. Never did. As many as up there, over 2,000 North Vietnamese up there. We didn't get one prisoner. Mm. They didn't either. But uh, that about ended that fight. We we won it, I guess you'd say. So Fourth Division come up there and replaced us, and we moved back into Dock Toll Air Base down there. Well, the next evening they sent us out on patrol again. After we know <laughs> we we out on patrol again. <laughs> And so uh, right after that, about two days later, I won all the R to Hawaii. And I stayed over seven days to come back. Everything was nice. <laughs> uh, got and then, that. And then Ted happens. Huh? And then Ted happens, right? Then Ted happened. All right. They, they, had, they, hadn't, they hadn't got fully prepared for, for Ted. But they had enough together to try. Well, they didn't do it but lose their ass on Ted. That's what the news media tried to tear you know what's more than apart for his report on Ted of how many he was talking about of the North got killed up there. They was trying to tear him up saying he was lying, this and that, and the intelligence was lying. He wasn't lying, he was telling the truth. Uh, they Said them people got killed, and them people got killed. They uh, lost approximately nine to one to our people, mm -hmm. didn't it? And there was, there was no lying about it. Westmoreland was one of the best generals I ever had to serve with. I served with him. He was in charge of 187 Regimental Combat Team when I finally got to it back there. He was a colonel in. And uh, then after that, he went to Washington, made general. Then I went to West Point and worked for him almost a year. And he made two star there. And I didn't see him no more until up in the 101st. He come over and as division commander of the 101st to Fort Campbell. Well, West Mall always wanted to do something the truth would remember. So all the troops lined up out there. Now you can imagine about 12,600 men in formation like that. Helicopter comes over and one man jumps out. Westmoreland. <laughs> he jumped out of that hole. L-19. Well, that was at West Point? No, this was at Fort Campbell when oh, he took okay. over the 101st. Oh, yeah, okay. And uh, he jumped out, landed, and General Sherman, who was the former commander he was replacing, as Westmoreland walked across the field over and went up on the little platform to review the troop. I remember General Sherman says, And gentlemen, I want to introduce you to your new commanding officer, <laughs> William C. Westmoreland. <laughs> and there he was. That's and and boy, he was he was just a good, good Officer, really good. Uh, he's always looking out for the troops, always looking out for the troops. And uh, then them duds in Washington, the news media, tried to put him down. I, I didn't see no justice in that. They they shouldn't have done that. But General Westmoreland died 4th of July, two years ago. Hmm. But he was, he was a fine officer. Well, now, the first time I was with him, he was a colonel. The second time I was with him, 101st Airborne, uh, I mean, 100, 100, 101st Airborne, yeah. And then, of course, Vietnam, the whole time I was over, he was in Vietnam. But, uh, what's Did he know you? Huh? Did he know you? Oh, yeah. That's another thing about him. If you ever met him, at least twice especially, he knows who you are. <laughs> he had a, some memory, man. <laughs> but he was, I mean, we weren't handshaking buddies, but we yeah. were that kind of buddy. That's good. But, 
but he was he was a fine officer. Did you ever have any bad jumps? I had one. When was this? Huh? Or is this when you were in Germany or, or yeah. after Vietnam? When, when I got them wings in there, on them wings, I broke my back. Tell me about throughout that story. Well, I was down getting my German wings. And so this is after Vietnam. Oh yeah, this yeah. after this is nineteen. What year was? Eighty. It's probably seventy something, huh? Let me see. Seventy-two. Seventy-three, I guess it was. Yeah, seventy-three. The very uh, jump area that I helped build or helped them build, I got hurt on it. I went down there to get my German, didn't have no German wings. I wanted to get my German wings. I went down there to get my German wings. You had to have, be on orders to do that. I mean, you couldn't just say, I'm going to get my German wings. It <laughs> didn't work that way. So, I went down and got my German wings, and I was on my fifth jump. And down I come, and snow was on the ground and all that stuff. And down I come, and all of a sudden, I looked up there, and my shoe was ripping like that. And uh, it just kind of went like that. Ooh. And I'm still up there, way up there. Tried to get my reserve out, couldn't do it. I was too close to the ground. So I hit the ground. I hit in that snow and just kind of ricocheted like that and went down a little embankment like that and landed down the bottom. When I got down the bottom of that uh, thing, they come down trying to get me out. And uh, I told them, my back's hurt. So they're very careful because you don't move troops if his back is hurt. So they brought a board out there and brought me up, slid me on that board. They had a hopeful uh, Germans was covering drop zone uh, safety that day. And they had a hopeful ambulance. They come out across that snow covered area and that old hopeful just wouldn't make it in that snow. <laughs> and they was trying to figure out how to get me from here to here. Get me off the drop zone. They couldn't didn't have nothing to haul me out there with. So they took a Volkswagen. I'm talking about a bug guy. They took the doors off of it and just left the seat for the German to drive it up there real close to the steering wheel <laughs> and slid that board up in there with the uh, with the uh, stretch on it <coughs> and come out through there up that Volkswagen and he come on out through that snow and <laughs> they put me on the on that board, and they strapped me down. They slid me back on behind the driver, and I was kind of sticking out both ends. Like <laughs> and here they went, right out there with that, with that bug, and carried me up to the edge of the drop zone where this ambulance was waiting. And uh, I went to the hospital. I had a limp and 12 ass, limp and 12 vertebrae, vertebrae had been crushed together. Mm. Uh, I had, uh, my, my tailbone was broke, and uh, this hip was fractured. And I had some internal, small, but some internal injury. I hit the ground pretty hard. Sounds like it, yeah. And they hauled me in the hospital, and I was up there in the hospital at, uh, at uh, Frankfurt about a month and they sent me to, uh, they had just opened up the medical center at Fort Gordon, Georgia, trying to replace some of the stuff at, in up in Washington there. But anyway, they sent me to Fort Gordon, Georgia, to that medical center. Well, I couldn't walk. I mean, I, I didn't have nothing from here going down because you, my, my spine had got hit. And, when your spine gets hit, you don't go trunk around. You just don't, you can't walk. So, about two months, I didn't walk at all. And then all of a sudden, one morning I woke up, I had pain in my leg. I said, man, I got pain in my leg. <laughs> and so I slid off the bed and got a walker 
and I'm dragging myself along that walk. And somebody run got the war boy. <coughs> Sergeant charged the war. <coughs> told him, you got a man now with a back injury walking. He's not supposed to be doing that. Huh. Yeah, he'd come. Yeah, he'd come. What are you doing more? Well, now, don't you think I look better walking than I do laying on that bed? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, that's not the point. You're supposed to see the doctor before you try to walk. And that doctor showed up about the time he said that, and he said, oh, no, if he can walk, let him walk. And I drove up and down that aisle there three or four times. And then they put me back in the bed. And uh, I don't know, it just, the pain started going away. And then they found them, that fractured vertebrae. Well, as first they talk about operating on it. Well, they, they didn't, they decided not to do that. Then they come down one day and said, would you sign a, a uh, whatever you signed, to let us do a, laser infusion on your back. And I said, what's that? Well, where that vertebrae is pushed together, what does it do is open up the space between them. <coughs> I said, will it help? Oh yeah, we think it will. I said, we'll do it. <laughs> so they came down the next day, done a laser infusion, and within a couple of weeks, I was walking. <coughs> Great. And, and then uh, that was, that's why I had to have this hip replaced years later though. That and that ankle, or knee. But uh, your back, your back, if your back gets injured, it's going to affect some part of your body uh, more so than your back. And what, what it was to me, Here's my hip right there. They come up here above my hip and below my hip, and I call the bone out from here to here. To here. And then they replaced it with whatever they put in there to replace it with. Hmm. And I got to thinking, how did they get that bone out like that? Because I've seen a little pig off of him, off of it, his, his bone. And they, they couldn't do that to me. <laughs> but I, I just couldn't figure out how they done that. <laughs> I got a scar, no bigger than that, where they done that. Wow. <coughs> anyway, he said, well, we gonna let you go back. Oh, no, that, that didn't end it all, though. About, I guess, three, four weeks later, they told the uh, first half sergeant says, "How far are you from being listening?" I said, "I got about sixty days." He said, "You want to stay in or get out?" I said, "I want to stay in." He said, "You better get there and re-enlist, and don't tell nobody now, because they're gonna put you out." And mm. uh, so I, I okay. So I went down. Had my six, and I was walking good. Went down and seen in the in the 